Sustainability of the Indian Higher Judiciary, authored by Dr. Orgo Sengupta, Research Director, Niti Center for Legal Policy. Niti has in the past published research on various topics related to judicial reform, and we continue to work on improving access to justice in India. Our justice, access, and lowering delays in India, the Jalni Mission, focuses on empirical research to reduce judicial delay and pendency. However, this is the first monograph to come out of our organization, and we are delighted to see you turn out in large numbers to engage with what is perhaps the most pertinent question relating to the state of our democracy today, the independence and accountability of the Supreme Court. As a young five-year-old think tank, we are deeply deeply honored that three of India's leading thinkers on legal issues have given us their time for a discussion on this topic, which will be moderated by all four. We have with us this evening Mr. Arun Jaitley. Mr. Arun Jaitley is the Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs of the Government of India. He has previously held the Defence, Commerce and Industry, Information and Broadcasting and Law and Justice portfolio. He is a senior advocate of the Supreme Court of India and through his blog, an astute commentator on contemporary legal issues. We also have with us Justice Kurian Joseph. Justice Kurian Joseph is a former judge of the Supreme Court of India. Previously, he has been acting Chief Justice of the High Court of Kerala and the Chief Justice of the High Court of Himachal Pradesh. According to legal uh, database Manu Patra, Justice Gurian Joseph has authored 1,145 judgments during the course of his career, a prolific record even by Supreme Court standards. And also joining us in this, this evening, Dr. Aparna Chandra. Dr. Chandra is an Assistant Professor of Law and Research Director, Center for Constitutional Law, Policy and Governance at the National Law University, Delhi. Dr. Chandra graduated from the National Law School of India, University of Bangalore, and received her LLM and JSD degrees from Yale Law School. Her doctoral dissertation examined the role of international law in domestic constitutional adjudication with focus on the Indian Supreme Court. Before I request our guests to release the book, I'd like to invite Ajay Pratap Singh of Cambridge University to share with us a few words about the publishers. Thank you very much, Jeet, for the wonderful opening and inviting on Uh On behalf of Cambridge University Press, I would welcome all of you to this August gathering. And I would also like to take this opportunity to give a brief introduction about Cambridge University Press. Cambridge University Press is a part of the University of Cambridge, and it's since its foundation in 1534. Press has been championing the university's mission of disseminating the knowledge in the pursuit of education, learning, and research at the highest levels of international excellence. Globally, we publish around 1,750 new books and over 400 journals every year. In India, our publishing program began in early 2012. And since then, we have published over 220 titles spanning across social sciences and various areas of science and technology. Our authors are based in the premier institutions in India as well as abroad. And that makes us uh, globally present. Our social sciences publishing program has had a strong focus in South Asia and the priority is to publish the cutting edge, pioneering and uh, accessible research that will aid researchers and students alike. We are devoted to achieving the press goal of customer centricity which in simpler terms means we are happy if our customers and authors are happy. Our authors are contented with the Cambridge experience and many of them have returned to publish their work again with us. Here I would like to thank Arvind Singh Gupta for choosing the Cambridge University Press for working his great work. And Arvind Singh Gupta's stellar research is a proud publication and I hope it is received very well. I know like me, you are all eagerly waiting for today's discussion, so I will not talk much and stop here. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Singh. I now invite you and uh, Kutsia Ahmed, along with Mr. Raknish Jha from Cambridge University Press, to join our guests and release the book.
I'd like to now invite Orgo to share with us his opening remarks. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming today. Distinguished guests on and off the dais, friends and family, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real honor to have everyone here today for the release of my monograph on the independence and accountability of the Indian higher judiciary. Uh, I'll take you back to a time in 2009, which was a cold Oxford afternoon, when I had to meet my college tutor and I had to tell him definitively about a subject that I wanted to research on. Now, unlike Sachin Tendulkar, who would have possibly known from the time he was born that he was going to play cricket for India, I had no clue what I wanted to specialize in. But fortunately for me, at that point of time, there was a massive judicial controversy which was erupting in India. Justice P.D. Dinakaran was the Chief Justice of the Karnataka High Court, and many of you here will know this, uh, and was recommended for appointment to the Supreme Court. At that time, several serious charges, including of illegal land acquisition, as well as of owning assets disproportionate to known sources of income, were raised. But the Supreme Court seemed to hesitate in taking an action. First, it requested him to go on leave, which he refused, saying that the Supreme Court Collegium didn't have power to do so. And then they transferred him to Sikkim High Court as Chief Justice. Uh, at that point of time, it was clear to me that there was something in the system which wasn't working. As a graduate student, it struck me that why would a judge who has an alleged case of corruption against him be transferred to Sikkim? Surely there must be, surely the people of Sikkim don't deserve worse judges than the rest of the country. Now, this was clearly something that I realized that there was more to it than met the eye. And in short, I had my research topic. That topic of the independence and accountability of the Indian higher judiciary is today this book which has been which has been released before you. It's been almost a decade to the day uh, since that day. And over the course of the decade, this topic has changed from being a conversation starter with a difficult tutor to an issue that is that I'm that I've spent a decade on, and is really something that I feel personally very passionate about. Uh, unfortunately, of course, over the course of the last decade, episodes such as the Dinakaran episode have occurred quite frequently. In fact, today, as it would be remiss. If we were to not admit that this was one of, we are living through one of these times at this point of time. Irrespective of the merits of the case of the allegations of sexual harassment against the Chief Justice, uh, some people, some quarters it's seen as a pro assault on judicial independence. In other quarters, it is seen as an inadequate mechanism of holding judges accountable. Now it is precisely this false binary between independence and accountability that I want to challenge in this book. Of course, we want judges to be independent, but we also want judges to be accountable, impartial, diverse, men and women of integrity. There are a range of values that we want all judges to possess. And in India, particularly because of the emergency, the judicial fraternity has a single-minded focus on judicial independence. That's certainly very valuable. But in this day and age, with all these cameras here and the day and age of social media where everyone not only has an opinion but also has a viable method of expressing it, it seems that the courts are falling short somewhere or the other. So the question that arises is that how do we restore some of this sheen that appears to be wearing off slowly? And how do we find a court that is both independent as well as accountable and perceived to be so? This is some, these are some of the questions that this book seeks to answer. Uh, it goes through the vexed issue of judicial appointments. Uh, this is something that Justice Kuriyam Joseph is very familiar with, having been part of the NJAC bench, which delivered the NJAC judgment, but also lesser known issues such as judicial transfers, impeachment, disciplining of judges, and post-retirement employment of judges, a topic that Mr. Jaitley has spoken a lot about particularly in the time when he was law minister and just thereafter. So there are a range of subjects that this book discusses and the ultimate end is to find a reform path that works for India, that looks at literature from around the world but is Indian in its conceptualization, that allows the Indian Supreme Court and the High Courts to find their place 
in this noisy and rambunctious country that we call home. Uh, this book really would not have been possible without many people. I don't have the time to thank everybody today, but you know who you are. But foremost, I'd like to thank everyone who's here today for coming. Uh, and the people on and off the dais. I just see Mr. Venugopal come in. Sir, if you could come in front, I would be very grateful. Uh, it was, uh, so it's wonderful that all of you could make it, particularly uh, Mr. Jaitley, Justice Courier Joseph, Aparna, Mr. Venugopal, several mentors and friends who are here today. I'm, I'm really delighted that you could make it. I'd like to thank the Kutsia and her whole team from the Cambridge University Press, Shohini, Oniruddho, all of without whom it couldn't have, this book wouldn't have been possible. But above all, I'd like to thank two people who unfortunately are not here with us today. The first is uh, Professor Enar Madhav Menon. Uh, Professor Menon passed away earlier this week and Aparna is here from National Law School, Bangalore. I'm here. I don't think we would have been here today had it not been for his vision. I know several people here in this, in this audience who have been taught by him and uh, it, is a, it is a real loss and I don't think we, any of us would have been here had it not been for his vision. And secondly, on a more personal note, I would also like to thank another person who's not here today but without whom this book would not have been possible, my father. And it is to him and my mother who is here today that I have my most undying love and gratitude. And thank you ladies and gentlemen for coming once again. I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you Orbo. May I now request you to take the conversation forward with our esteemed okay. guests. If time permits, we may have a short q and session at the end of the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, since uh, the stage is set, not only with the context in which we are having this discussion, but this issue of independence and accountability, which has been a live issue for a long period of time in the Indian higher judiciary. So, uh, Mr. Jaitley, you've been a law minister, now the finance minister, but perhaps above all, a senior advocate of the Supreme Court, an institution that I know you dearly love. So, in your experience wearing various hats, where do you think this question of independence and accountability lies? I'll invite you to make your opening remarks on this. Justice Kuryan, Dr. Chandra, Mr. Virigopal, and all here, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a privilege to be here for Orgya's uh, book launch, which is on a subject which is uh, extremely close to his heart. I spotted him when he was uh, still studying in England. And he had come to invite me for a lecture at his university. And uh, both on way and back, this is perhaps the most important subject we had discussed. <coughs> <coughs> I think this whole debate of uh, judicial independence, one aspect, uh, there is no controversy that independence is absolutely required. When you were introducing me, uh, one aspect perhaps which you forgot, that both in parliament or in government or in opposition or in the political system, I belong to probably India's only accountable institution. Uh, we are bashed every day, we are criticized by our critics, we are questioned and that is why probably people have to be more alert. Elections are held once in five years, but we have to look at the newspapers and the news channels and the social media, to your colleagues in the party, to your critics outside, because you have always several answers to give. Somehow, unfortunately in India, cynicism about the only accountable institution in India has considerably built up. Independence of judiciary, and this is my fundamental disagreement with the NJAC judgment, is obviously an essential part of the basic structure of the constitution. But so is parliamentary democracy. It's perhaps the most important part of the basic structure of the constitution. So is an elected government, a part of the basic structure of the constitution. 
So is the sovereignty of parliament itself in lawmaking, which is an essential part of the constitution. And therefore, to build a system that uh, in today's world, there was a time when this was all not discussed. During the last one and a half years, uh, I had to undergo several treatments and therefore I had a sufficient time to read at least the history of uh, how judges were appointed. I recollect that even during the first Prime Minister's tenure of Pandiji's tenure, there used to be serious reservations. But then the consultation process made sure that a process was arrived at at which judges were appointed. I think it reached its low on the Keshwananda eve, not really during the emergency, where union ministers were asked to go handpicked judges who could be brought to the Supreme Court and who could tilt the arithmetic in the Keshwananda case. Uh, I think Tempton and Yarujina's uh, masterpiece in this will tell you what the state of uh, appointment process at that stage was. And even an independent Chief Justice like Sikri had at that stage to succumb to a large number of appointments. In fact, each appointee on the eve could be identified to his de facto appointing authority in the government. And that reflected in the word, word in itself. Of course, having tasted blood, it was supersession, then transfers, and then as you rightly mentioned, the backlash post-emergency, and the stress came on independence with several good judges. <coughs> Post-82, I think there was a, after the first judge's case, at least at the high court levels, there was a reasonable amount of politicization which went on. Post-1993, it substantially declined. And therefore, the need was being felt that could it only be the input of one institution or should it be inputs of several institutions? And that is how, through the last 30 years, this whole idea of the National Judicial Commission was born. I believe we can always discuss what should be the composition, to what extent the judicial primacy should be there. But at least some representatives, the way we structure it, you had a lone government nominee, namely the law minister. And the rationale of the judgment, which I believe is wholly incorrect, that having an executive participation violates the basic structure. Independence of judiciary is a part of the basic structure. But what will be the composition of the Judicial Commission extending the basic structure to this extent and saying that the accountable executive will always be a threat to the appointment process, even though the original constitution had envisaged a role for the elected government. So what was there in the original constitution could never be violated the basic structure. And then you could have a debate how the two eminent uh, public figures or jurists are to be appointed. And uh, that process would help it, in fact, uh, to enable it to become a process where you have a larger amount of inputs. You can't have likings, dislikings, limited sources of information, at times, inaccurate sources of information coming in. And the checks and balances would itself have been adequate. The structure itself is debatable. How much primacy, whether you should have one public representative or you must have two. All that can be a matter of subject matter of discussion. But uh, I think the exclusivity itself has taken away the transparency. And I think, uh, though I must personally confess, that today on the second issue of accountability, and when I discuss this, I discuss this, divorce my political affiliation, because that's been an independent part of my personality, my relationship as a lawyer. I was originally of the view that uh, the same body really must be the accountable mechanism. 
though my own view still leans largely in that favor. But uh, this whole alternative question, must you have outsiders in the accountability mechanism? Itself is raised from within the judicial institution. I think it will still do a lot of good to us in the system. If the accountability mechanism, and once a tradition is established, that you have a, a judicial primacy, the senior most judges of court, uh, a high court chief justice, a judge of the high court is involved, being added to it, uh, some eminent public person, selected by a very, very careful process by a very high powered position, <laughs> and uh, then of course the executive being represented by the law minister. If this is a process, governments will come and go. <coughs> People will also mature and learn how to really handle these institutions. I think uh, it probably would address both the questions which you have raised in your book to a larger extent. That's all I have to say as my own opinion. Thank you very much, Mr. Jaitley, for those opening remarks spanning the history of the judicial appointments process and perhaps the changing nature of accountability. Uh, just as Korean saying, I should go to Aparna. So, Aparna, as in, given that you are the academic on the panel, and uh, there is this conflation that is often made that uh, judicial independence and accountability are in conflict with each other. And you, you are a student of the Indian Constitution and the separation of power scheme in the Constitution. So perhaps you'd like to dwell a little bit about the theoretical basis for judicial independence and accountability and related to current events in about five to seven months. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I should begin by uh, telling you that uh, when I started my PhD work, I was told that your uh, PhD is not finished till you get your book out. So congratulations on finally getting done with your PhD. You can now move on. And <laughs> thank you for uh, inviting me to discuss the book. Um, I mean, it sounds cliche, but it's so true, tragically so, that this book is very uh, timely. As you yourself mentioned, the um, entire um, episode with the, with the way the Supreme Court has handled the sexual harassment uh, allegations against the CJI uh, has made it very imperative for us to look at these concepts of judicial independence, judicial accountability, how we deploy them in our, in our judicial discourses, in our legal discourses, in our political discourses, what they really mean and what's the relation between them. And at the same time, I should also say that old concerns of executive interference to the extent that uh, it's there in institutional independence of the judiciary, <coughs> concerns again which have been exemplified only this uh, week with the returning of another set of collegium recommendations on what looked like the uses of pretext highlights that these concerns are not episodic but perennial. Um, so to me, the two major contributions that the, uh, that the book makes to our thinking about judicial independence and accountability are these. One, of course, that it unpacks what it means, what these terms mean. And I think I really like the questions that you asked about judicial uh, accountability and uh, independence. Who's accountable to you? For what? How secure? For what purpose? And likewise, for judicial independence. Of course, that helps us understand the points of intersection, commonality, conflict between uh, independence and accountability. And I completely agree with you that there's a very problematic judicial discourse, perhaps rooted in the history um, that Mr. JT just outlined for us, but problematic nonetheless uh, of, of viewing independence and accountability as necessary and integral to each other, and in doing so, ending up only using judicial independence as a shield against judicial uh, accountability. So I think that's, that's a very, very important uh, point. Uh, the second one, um, I thought that was very important, uh, the major contribution of your book, is the point that you make about linking independence and accountability to judicial role. And in that, in fact, of course, is the framing of the book. You begin by talking about the changing judicial role and how that's led to an increase in demand for, need for uh, judicial uh, accountability. And when judges are exercising so much uh, power, uh, independence of the judiciary, questions about, of accountability cannot be restricted only to questions of impartiality of uh, uh, judges. <coughs> I would go a bit further and say then who the judge is, the worldview that the judge brings, her background, her experience, training, all of that goes into shaping the trajectory of a case where the court exercises such vast powers. So if you're reporting this much power in the hands of the judge, 
then what mechanisms do we have to ensure that the judge is wielding that power independently, is wielding it responsibly, and wielding it in a manner uh, that allows us to hold the judge accountable? But if this is the question, and you suggest in your book that this is the question, then our accountability mechanisms cannot be restricted to whether the executive has more or less power in the appointment of judges, what are the internal or disciplining mechanisms, uh, or how do you uh, secure impartiality or perception uh, thereof post-retirement. Uh, I think we have to look at questions around diversity, for example, as an integral element of independence of the judiciary, so that the system does not become captured by particular worldviews uh, and experiences. And that's the problem with the collegium system, of course, the Kabbalistic nature of the collegium, which impacts this element of judicial independence, like a point's like. Um, and this not only limits diversity of identities and experiences, but also identities of, uh, of uh, diversity of ideas promoting groupthink. And that, that becomes a huge uh, problem. And I would think that that element of diversity has to be captured again, then cannot be captured within the binary of the collegium system versus the NJAC. Uh, those, are, those, those matters of detail would be very, very important in working out how, uh, uh, whether, the, whatever mechanism we have uh, promotes independence or not. Likewise, independence of the judiciary cannot be independence in today's day and age only from the executive or only from the government. It has to also be from other power centers, particularly with the rise of the importance of the market, other market forces, uh, non-governmental forces that wield enormous power. So a committed judiciary, for example, may, may not just be committed, may not be committed to the government, but might be committed to other ideologies. And diversity helps in breaking this idea of a judiciary committed to a single ideology um, and the dangers that that might bring. Second on the question of decisional uh, accountability. And you, as you mentioned, publicly available reasoned orders are a big element of decisional uh, accountability. And in that case, the recent uh, directions that the higher courts have taken in, uh, in this respect raise a lot of concerns, I would think. So unreasoned orders, interim orders that feel like dictates rather than reasoned decisions, taking evidence and sealed covers to some extent, this sort of affidavit culture where important factual elements of the case, which might otherwise be subject to scrutiny, proof, contestation, are taken on affidavit. This all goes to the question of decisional accountability, I would think. And even when the court is providing reasons for its uh, decisions, the quality of reasoning can be determinative of, of uh, decisional inter, uh, independence. You yourself rightly point out that this was the problem with ADM Jabal Court, that the reasoning was such that it was unduly deferential to the government of the day, um, that not only uh, that it did not contain the requisite elements of judicial uh, independence. And I know we will disagree on this, but to my mind, there are very similar tendencies that play in the Alhar judgment more recently. So if in the ABM Jabalpur case, judges were expressing a diamond <coughs> right, diamond hard fork, and I'm quoting uh, uh, Justice Chandrachur uh, here, that the executive will not ill-treat ill detainees. In Aadhaar, the court looked at the question of hacking of CIBRs and said that it would go into the issue, but it left the issue with, and I quote, a hope that CIDR would find out the ways and means to curb any such tendency. <coughs> and this jurisprudence of hope, I would say, has no place in a democracy, not putting the government to strict proof of its claims, relying on assurances and PowerPoints, is to my mind a threat to decisional independence. Uh, it is not about this government or that, uh, but about institutional practices of institutionalizing a culture of justification for the exercise of state power. I'll just finally end with saying that you end your book at possibly what is currently the biggest uh, concern, which is the functioning of the Office of the Chief uh, Justice. And over the years, of course, the role of the Chief Justice has grown from being uh, sort of primus inter paris to a more substantive role. The, uh, the kind of administrative powers that uh, the Chief Justice has uh, now has uh, can and apparently does impinge on judicial independence and basically in the functioning of the office of the Chief Justice can bring, uh, can bring about a threat uh, to judicial independence from within. I'll just end by saying that, uh, you know, when the uh, sexual harassment allegations came out and the Supreme Court constituted that, that bench on a Saturday, they called it a matter of great public importance touching upon the independence of the judiciary. And I think that was very aptly termed because this was a case about the independence of the judiciary the question was how independently, how much without fear or favor does the judiciary decide when it's called, uh, when one of its own is called to account. And unfortunately, I think the court has taken a part of, part of judicial exceptionalism. 
and in following very opaque processes, maybe the biggest threat to judicial independence today is coming from India. So on that very, very pessimistic note, I will stop. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aparna. Uh, Justice Puriyan, Aparna has finished on a pessimistic note, but I've always known you as an optimist. So perhaps as if you could show us some silver linings to this dark cloud that has been painted before us about the judiciary. Uh, and particularly, as I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to take on to anything specific because we have time to discuss some specific issues. But uh, in your long judicial career, as if you would have seen, uh, irrespective of political party, and given the fact that you were in the religion, you would have seen and interacted with government. Is the question of independence of judiciary primarily one of independence from government? Or as Aparna was trying to say, it could be from a variety of interests, including from within you. Right. <coughs> Thank you again. Honorable Sri Aaron Jaitley, Aparna, Sri Venugabal, Attorney General of India. <coughs> Dear uh, senior advocates and eminent uh, people participating in this conversation. I feel it could be a conversation not only among ourselves, but it should be a conversation with the people sitting there also. Well, as you rightly said, I am always an optimistic person. Now that Mr. Bernadoval is here, he was actually arguing in the NJC case. He had a note of optimism in that uh, argument that he made a fervent request to the court to read down the act and save the legislation. I don't know if you remember, you must be remembering because you never forget what you argue. <laughs> <coughs> well, that was, I should confess, that was not actually taken forward by the by the people who argued, or by, by the government, that's a fact. Had it been taken forward and better suggestions had come as to how to save the, the, the legislation, and in the sense, by ensuring participation uh, in the process of appointment by inputs, not putting in, but inputs. That's the whole difference. So, as Mr. Uh, uh, Honorable Minister rightly said, independence of the judiciary is absolutely required. But whether the question is whether it is absolute independence or not. To me, I always equate it with the chastity of a virgin. The independence of a judiciary in the Indian context. And the Honorable Minister rightly pointed out to Keshavananda. See, that's a classic case where you can manipulate the judgment. You can bring in people and then get an appropriate chief justice to constitute the bench. It's not difficult uh, uh, in the context, the uh, Indian context now, to know the mind of uh, the judges and constitute an appropriate bench of any quorum and get a desired judgment. That's why I always advocated that in such uh, sensitive issues, the, even the quorum of the bench should reflect the diversity of the country. This all matters going to the very root of uh, the independence of the judiciary. Because independence of the judiciary, according to me, is part of rule of law. And if you believe that ours is a country which is governed by the principle of rule of law, if that be so, the judiciary must be absolutely independent. <coughs> when I said judiciary must be independent, I have two dimensions to it. One, the judiciary as an institution, it should be insulated. I agree with Abadna that it should be insulated not only from the government, not only from the political parties, uh, corporates, or any such pulls or pressures or pushes. Pull, pressure, push, all these three uh, the judiciary should be uh, absolutely insulated. <coughs> then the judges. <coughs> See, we believe in the first principle that it is enough, not enough that justice is done, but it should also appear to be done. It is this perception, it is this faith of the people that the the justice is justice should also be 
should have been should be appeared to have been done. That would depend on the the the, the court, the judges. They should be perceived to be absolutely independent. I know quite a few lawyers are here, and, and the, our honourable minister himself has been a long uh, crusader for uh, justice in Supreme Court for quite long. It's not uh, a secret that uh, you know what result you would get if a matter goes to a bench or a B bench or a C bench. Maybe on a compassion, maybe on a philosophy, maybe on an ideology, maybe on an approach, maybe uh, there are several factors all these lawyers know. They know practically 75% of the result they will be in a position to predict because they have read the mind of the judge. They read the mind of the judge not in sense of uh, the oath the judge has taken without fear or prayer, affection or evil. These are the four caveats we take or four, four solemn uh, what they call uh, um, principles on which I swear an oath as a judge. Anyone, without fear or favor, affection or will, you are the constitution. You are not, the, uh, you are not appointed not to uphold anything else. You are appointed the constitution. And that upholding should be without fear or favor, affection or will. Now, with regard to the appointment, the initial appointment is one process, then the transfer is another process, appointment of chief justice is a process. And appointment of a judge to the Supreme Court is a process. And thankfully, uh, appointment of CGI is not a matter of big controversy now because uh, apart from the two couple of uh, dark episodes in the history, it has been on the basis of a signal theory. So your uh, graph is clear when you come to the Supreme Court. But the question is, when you come to the Supreme Court, what time you come to the when what time you are brought to the Supreme Court makes a whole difference. You can design everything by bringing a person of your choice so that you know he will become a chief justice or he will be in the collegium or he will be there as a, uh, as a decide, decisive factor. All these are possible. So that's why I said you know the absolute independence is what is required. But the way the things have happened in the recent past in the matter of appointment, in the matter of transfer, um, etc. I would uh, I must say Justice Verma took how many years to say that he regretted in having written that judgment. For me it's uh, hardly 3-4 years in having written that judgment. It's, uh, I should be saying that uh, I should be starting to regret in having held in so many words that it is so absolute. The other way would have been much better. If you want to ask me the examples, I am prepared to give you that example. So, so the way the independence has been affected uh, uh, in the matter of seniority, in the matter of delay, in the matter of... Uh, see, as the law stands now, we can only uh, return the file only once. Once the, the collegium reiterates, you cannot uh, again send it back. Now it is third time, fourth time, fifth time. It goes on and the appointment takes quite long. Maybe there are inputs, but inputs should be made available in the first instance. And you can return a file only if you have a fresh inputs available. Not in terms of the, all the inputs available, because it's not a question of a choice. It's a question of a decision being honored, because the law is like that only. Unless the law is changed, you have to abide by the law. And that is the question of uh, rule of law also. So therefore, um, according to me, as things stand now, it is absolutely independent. If you want to say the parliament, I have no doubt the parliament and democracy is a part of the basic structure. Sovereignty is a part of the basic structure. Secularism is part of the basic structure. But who will say that what is secularism? Who will say what is this parliamentary democracy? Who will say what is this uh, sovereignty? Who will say what is this socialism as conceived in the constitution? What the constitution is? According to me, and I'm sure the Honorable Minister also would agree, because he is also part of uh, the system as such. What the constitution is, is of course for the law to be defined. And the defining of the law is not as things stand now, it's not by the people, but the judiciary. That's the whole thing. And uh, but for this uh, court, 
defining the law, this country would have been different. That's all what I wanted to say as of now. First, we'll participate in the conversation. Thank you very much, Justice Julian. I think of all the things you said, there was a very candid confession that maybe you're beginning to regret uh, the judgment and hopefully my, my book will persuade you further along in that direction. <laughs> Uh, but let's turn to let's turn to one issue uh, which I discuss in my book uh, on the issue of post-retirement employment. It's an issue where on which both uh, Mr. Jaitley and Mr. Skurian have spoken about. And uh, in a little study that I had done, uh, and I looked at 50 retirees from the Supreme Court in a in a given time period between 2004 and 12. And you have suggested a cooling period of three years. Cooling cooling period of three years is my alternative suggestion. Uh, but my primary suggestion is that actually the retirement age of judges of the High Court and Supreme Court should be A, equalized, B, it should be increased to 70 years, and C, post-retirement appointments to statutory tribunals and commissions should stop. Now, uh, Mr. Jaitley, if I could come to you. You had said very famously that some judges know the law, other judges know the law minister. <laughs> This was a long time ago. Uh, do you think, what do you think about post-retirement employment of judges in statutory position? You see, it's become, uh, there's, a, there's a serious problem. The serious problem is that there are a large number of quasi-judicial tribunals in the country where appointments are made either by the government or by the government in consultation with the Chief Justice of India. <coughs> And they import, perform important functions. And therefore, somebody has to manage them. And people who had 10 and 15 and 20 years of uh, judicial experience are normally considered quite suitable to manage them. This then leads to a rat race. You are retiring on such and such day. What is the assignment you are writing? And, uh, it almost becomes an entitlement unless somebody voluntarily, because of his conviction, takes a stand that I don't want a post-retirement job. And therefore, a wire media will have to be worked out that you will need the best people in these tribunals. Uh, adequate consultation as far as the judicial institution is concerned. And a cooling off period is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, a cooling off, there could be a nexus between the judgments written in the last few months leading up to the retirement and the <coughs> getting of that particular assignment. But having said this, I just want to make uh, a comment, uh, slightly contrary. Now, if I see, understand both what uh, Dr. Aparna Chandra and Justice Korean have said, they pointed out the problem. And that's the difference between accountable and non-accountable institutions. Uh, you throw up a problem and say, I have no solutions. And, and, uh, and then uh, the problem is that uh, some people have a problem with every solution. Uh, because that then leads to a, a situation where you can't correct. Since 1993, what is the real say of the executive in appointments? The High Court Collegium recommends post-98, earlier it was the Chief Justice. Then the Supreme Court Collegium approves. The Law Ministry sends its inputs. In most cases, the recommendations are accepted as they are. It won't even be 1 on 10. It probably will be 1 on 20. Where the government has some material, they place that material. The court either recalls it or the court recommends it. That's a part of the consultation process. And that part of the consultation process you consider as a threat to judicial independence. Because even under the judgment, which usurped all the right to the judiciary and kept the executive out, bare consultation is the only right. And therefore, the government's right to give even an input once. This is an exaggerated, impractical thought. And therefore, I would suggest, let us be clear, in the last 26 years from 1993, most appointments to the High Court 
if not all, to the Supreme Court have been judiciary sponsored appointments. If the executive has deferred, in most cases the executive is overruled. If there is a cogent material, it is accepted. And therefore, the problems which have arisen, the accountable executive is therefore the villain. And those creating these appointments, uh, uh, one doesn't see a fault with that system. And therefore, I'm glad Justice uh, Joseph uh, made that comment. Because I have never, since 1950, when the Supreme Court came into existence, or even before that, ever seen a judgment where the line interpretation is exactly the opposite of what the statute says. You can advance the purpose, you can add or subtract something, but to interpret a law absolutely to the contrary, I think this is the only judgment in Indian history which has done so. And that was done really to keep that power. Only we can preserve it. And when you want to preserve that power, please look at the history uh, of what has happened. More layers being added, uh, and those layers can always be debated as to who should be there, what kind of people should be there. But that will always, to the accountability and the appointment manager, add to some credibility. They won't take away the credibility. So I think that actually that that reminds me of an interesting <coughs> phrase that, that I quote in my book that James Madison uses in the American context, because the US has this system where the president dominates and the Senate ratifies. And the reason why they wanted a political system was because they felt that ambition should counteract ambition. That if the executive has a say, then perhaps it will actually counterintuitively interfere <coughs> less in insidious ways and do it openly. And that was the that was the view that was taken. But if you also, if you do want a re actual reform suggestions, I have tried one in this book. So whoever is interested in actual reform suggestions can read this. But Justice Kurian, coming to you, you have pub you are one of the few judges who have publicly declared that you will not take up a post-retirement position that is given by any government. Uh, why do you think that most of your brethren are not of the same view? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I would like to quote the Mr. Venugobal. I know that you remember uh, you were part of uh, a South African. Yes, we had a mission in South Africa. We went there, and then we had a discussion on this issue. So they said in India there are two types of judges towards retirement. One is uh, forward looking; the other is looking forward. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my personal conviction that I should not belong to the other category. That does not mean that the judges who are taken up an uh, assignment are do belong to the uh, former category. No, I would uh, uh, agree with uh, the honourable minister that now that you have created a lot of statutes, where it, where the tribunals are to be manned only by one, maybe the former chief justice of India, two, as a human rights commission is to be manned only by the chief justice, former chief justice of India. It's actually. Result is a resolution happened that looking at it. And many a former uh, judge to the Supreme Court, and many a former Chief Justice, and many a former judge to the High Court. So you have to find somebody, no doubt about it. But why don't you try uh, an appointment commission for such appointments uh, in the tribunals? Why don't we start with uh, an appointment, just, uh, like uh, a tribunal appointment commission? The way you have uh, executive participation, law minister participating, judges participating, and having open uh, appearances. Just, just, just have a try on that also. Therefore, people with uh, some self-respect will always uh, uh, have a, a, a appropriate scrutiny rather than the looking forward syndrome. <laughs> no, I think that's, a, that's an excellent suggestion because we can move towards a towards the commission model, but perhaps one thing that about our Both are only for post <laughs> I would say most certainly for both. Uh, but for the former, we may need a constitution amendment that has to be very carefully designed, since now judicial primacy, which is part of judicial independence, is now part of the basic structure of the constitution. So it might be a little bit of a difficult constitutional amendment to draft. Uh, but as far as the question of returning to the question about now that you had raised of accountability, now, we tend to think always that, you know, we are living in exceptional times. But when during researching the book, I realized that even 1988 to 89 was a bit of an exceptional time with the impeachment or proposed impeachment of Justice Ramaswamy uh, from the Supreme Court. 
and, and it was fascinating to go through the papers to see actually at that point of time, right from the allegations of corruption when he was a judge in the Punjab and Haryana, Chief Justice of the Punjab and Haryana High Court, right through to the impeachment motion in Parliament which was defeated because of an abstention by certain political parties. Uh, and I think that that raises the question that is it time to think of accountability measures short of impeachment? Because impeachment became an overtly political process. And so do we need to think of other measures because there could be misconduct where political parties may not want to take it up or may want to take up cases for extraneous um, Thanks. Could I go to the post-retirement uh, right, question uh, briefly. first briefly uh, though? Also because as an academic you never retire, so it's good to talk about post-retirement for others. Um, just to say, I, I think, that's a policy. Yeah. Well, uh, um, if uh, I, I just want to say that we should also make a distinction between post-retirement jobs that are uh, offered to judges while in service and post-retirement jobs that they get uh, thereafter, and the. Whatever you say about the ones that happen thereafter, the ones that happen in service are definitely very problematic for all the reasons that have been highlighted. The second to say, you know, again, I, I don't want to keep harping on this point, but we keep thinking about interference from the government. But what are the other alternatives that you have? You know, the suggestions that you give in your book about raising pay and perks for, you know, in the post-retirement period, raising, raising the uh, retirement age, are all also very crucial because if not for government uh, appointments, then what is the other alternative? Why is the commercial arbitration practice less of a uh, threat to <coughs> skewing incentives while one is a judge uh, than than a government uh, practice? I mean, so that's that's a concern that we need to uh, also uh, keep in mind. Coming to the question of um, a, a, a question of impeachment and other disciplinary mechanisms, well, there is one, right and we don't know for better or for worse whether the sexual harassment, the, the Justice Bobley Committee was actually that in-house mechanism or whether it was something else uh, entirely, it's not very clear. Uh, I would, I, I mean, in principle, there can be really very little objection to say that we need other accountability mechanisms. Uh, but the current ones that we have, to the extent that we have it, the in-house uh, mechanism is fully in I mean, of course, one, it centralizes even more power in the Chief Justice of India. Uh, second, it doesn't appear to cover the Chief Justice of India. Three, it is supposed to be completely informal. Uh, four, clearly it's supposed to be confidential, despite the uh, right to information act and, and, and everything else. So the present mechanisms that we have are fully inadequate. These are, these are conversations that have happened uh, before. I would think, therefore, that having such a mechanism is, of course, required and needed. Uh, Self-regulation in that sense is when there is a threat to independence, like we say for media uh, independence, there should be self-regulatory mechanisms uh, because you don't want an outside uh, interference. But the current existing mechanism is really uh, less than <laughs> Mr. Jaitley, would you have any suggestions on what kind of mechanism we can think about? You see, uh, I've had a opportunity in the last 20 years in Parliament to deal with several cases where impeachment motions either came before or were proposed to be brought before. Uh, in fact, the only one after Justice Ramaswamy's case, which was lost out because of abstinence by one political party, uh, which was seriously debated in the Rajya Sabha, I was just the same. So much was saying. And uh, uh, out of my interest in the subject, I had spent some 30 to 40 hours with a group of young lawyers. I was the leader of opposition, studying the entire evidence. Because my first lesson was that parliament really sits as a court and doesn't sit as a political body because uh, it's a cross-institutional accountability. And uh, after Justice said made a presentation, and it was a fairly emotional presentation, Fortunately, I was ready with most of the facts. Uh, the government, surprisingly, was not so ready. They thought it would be carried. People in the lobby, amongst members of parliament, one lady member walked up to me from an Indian state and said, Ye bohat bola 
And that gave me that one comment, still rings in my ears. Uh, how seriously are these impeachment motions to be taken up? I then had the onerous task of uh, really speaking for two days, <coughs> uh, two, two and a half hours on one day and continued another two hours on the next day, finally to convince every member of parliament. And as the uh, leader of the Congress party, Mr. Pranam Mukherjee took a very statesman-like attitude and therefore we passed it in the upper house and that led to the resignation of the judge. <coughs> I think the legislature also has to realize what its responsibility in the impeachment is. Otherwise, let's not be a person here. I have no hesitation in admitting that I am a relative conservative. I would completely be on the side of the judge, uh, uh, unless, of course, the facts are very glaring. A process of mass intimidation of Indian judiciary has begun. <coughs> And it has not begun from the executive. If you look at the social media, if you look at the articles being published uh, in newspapers, if you look at the last two years, the same familiar byline in a newspaper will reproduce to you the conversation which took place in the full court, in the collegium, a letter written by one judge to the chief justice or the other. And therefore, these kind of trends in the system have emerged. And the result of which is that people have been encouraged. If this is what judges can say about each other, then one, why can't I? And therefore you have uh, in court, it was unimaginable that somebody would say, I threaten a walk out if my uh, 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 viewpoint is not accepted in a court. You've never had a court of this kind. And therefore, when you deal with allegations of judges against judges, it's a very popular thing to throw mud. And because it looks attractive and there is a presumption in demolishing personalities uh, in our system, there has to be a system you have, you should really trust. And that system, over the years which has uh, evolved, at present is that in an extreme case it will be impeachment. You had several frivolous impeachments filed only to intimidate judges. Second, short of that they have the in-house mechanism which people uh, say is not transparent enough and so on. Uh, the judges have their own argument for that. For example, you have the first stage where the Chief Justice takes a prime office view. You have a second stage where he calls uh, for the response of the judge and then he refers to a committee. And the committee finds that an allegation against a judge that he asked for 50 crores in the case is absolutely false. Now people will remember 50 crores and next time when I ask the litigant which court did your case go to, he says that 50 crore judge. <laughs> Are we going to now, you see there is a for want of a better word in English, the judiciary in this country has survived because of honor. There is a word of Hindustani or Urdu or Hindi, ki ikbal hota hai. The courts have survived because of this and if every day efforts are going to be made, in order to demolish the Iqbal of the judiciary. And these are not, if you look up the history of the last five years, or seven years, or eight years, how many attempts have come from governments, either this government or the previous government, and compare it with the kind of threats which have come from other instruments in a society that we can do this, and judges out of graciousness, take it with a smile, don't object to it, uh, they think it's magnanimous not to use contempt power, and so on. I think we are reaching a stage where people love making allegations. At least we politicians have the ability uh, <coughs> to refute them. We have the ability to go and sue them in a court so that the truth can be established. A judge is completely handicapped and a punctual reputation can never be retrieved back to him. And therefore I go back to my original point even if I am sitting in the same tune that you probably will require a credible mechanism. I am not uh, dogmatic that it should be called the National Judicial Commission or something. But something which has a judicial privacy, I am quite clearly of that opinion, but which will have participation of at least one or two other sections of the society. And that should be the process which then has to come to the protection of an honest judge and should be able to then 
really find out who the outlier is. That's, that alone can save the judicial institution. Sir, there is a little um, uh, problem in that. You, you are asking, speaking about two aspects. One is uh, the initial appointment, the other is uh, the disciplining or the what you call the, 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 the in house uh, <coughs> mechanism to preserve the honor. I 100% agree with you. This honor to be preserved by the institution and it is uh, required for the sustenance of democracy of this country also because. If the honor of this institution is lost, because uh, the faith is shaken, then it is gone. So the honor is to be preserved. As you, I 100% agree with you that uh, uh, an absolute and foolproof in-house mechanism or uh, in-house rather mechanism is required for preserving the honor. But as far as uh, appointment is concerned, we had a college system which has been in practice after the uh, that this case. Well, if you, the, judge, the lawyers were here, if you read, in fact, that my judgment was quoted in the parliament <coughs> by the law minister also. In fact, I made a severe scathing criticism on the college system, the way it is functioning now. But hardly anything has been done as to how to improve that uh, college system. We spoke about the secretariat. There is no secretariat. We still uh, go on on our, uh, what they call, the, the, the systems and practices which are already there, except that we have started uploading something on the website. That's the only improvement that has been done. But uh, has any discussion or any serious uh, uh, decision that is taken, by the, the reason for a decision, is it uploaded? It cannot be uploaded according to me. Reason is, suppose a person has given consent to a judge, and if he is not selected, if he is a good uh, practicing lawyer, if he is not selected, and uh, can we say in the website that uh, on account of his lack of integrity, he is not selected? Will it not affect his uh, self-respect? Will it not affect his profession? As he, given, he has given consent, he will become a judge. He has not given consent to defy him in, in, in public. So these are also serious issues. But unless we have a foolproof, uh, uh, what you call, a system by a, a regular secretariat for the collegium to take an appropriate decision, on the basis of all the available inputs given by the public, given by the government, given by eminent men, whatever it is, no problem. This is why I said I started regretting. <coughs> Reason is, my suggestion on improvement of the quality system has not been done. And it, according to me, it has gone worse. That's why, in fact, <laughs> I'm one of the persons who wrote uh, so many letters uh, in my career as a judge in the Supreme Court. The, those were the letters written to the chief justice, not in the first instance, no. I had several times met the chief justice and the court is concerned that we should take remedial steps to show that uh, the privacy of the institution is protected. See, I don't know, should I say that the, it is privacy or privacy is the only issue? <laughs> then it has gone. Privacy has gone. You have surrendered, compromised. Compromised uh, with uh, the, 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 the settled the principles as far as uh, your recommendation, the point of recommendation, the seniority that is we kept, etc. It's all taken uh, bizarre, no? This is where I said, this, this is one occasion I had to write a strong letter. But uh, unfortunately, even then, nothing has been done on that. So, this, this is existing system which is 100% uh, defective. It needs to be streamlined appropriately. I agree with the Honourable Minister that we need to have an appropriate uh, system for that. <coughs> I am only glad about two things that there is a healthy discussion within the judiciary with judges disagreeing with others and second that your letter wasn't leaked because this is clearly contrary to the current trend uh, that we see. Uh, I think there are several issues of judicial reforms that have been highlighted here as in regarding appointments accountability, impeachment and post-retirement employment, all of which are in the book. But unfortunately, we've really run out of time. I'm sorry personally to all those who had questions who couldn't ask, ask it. But uh, on behalf of Cambridge University Press and Vidhi, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, particularly many of my mentors and senior members of the bar, like Mr. Venagopal, Mr. Gandhi, Mr. Narizuma, Mr. Dutra, who are all here today. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. And my, my particular thanks uh, to Justice Kurian Joseph, 
Shravan Jaitley and Aparna for such a lively and enriching discussion. I hope it's excited you all to buy my book and I'm very happy to, for many, many copies to be sold. Thank you very much for coming once again. Thank you.